I grew up in the city of Chicago on the north side. My mom was a single mom, a first generation American. Once I started getting into like my teenage years, it became really apparent that we were really, really poor. So poor that like we would eat beans and tortillas for like weeks straight. It became more and more clear that like I needed to make money. I ended up being initiated into a gang at 15, and that's when I was introduced to the lifestyle of what I refer to as pimping. The first trafficker I, I had, he would buy me very expensive things, very luxurious items. He would give me money for food to buy groceries. He figured out how to prey on those vulnerabilities and really use them for his own evil purposes. The option to say no was entirely non-existent. Me showing fear was not an option either. I had to put on a really brave face. I always say I lived a double life because while I was at school, I was Gabby. But then once I left school and I got on the bus to go back home, I became Veronica. I started looking older and this particular trafficker specifically wanted girls that looked young, like between the ages of 10 and 14 young. By the time I was 16, 17 year old, I served him no purpose at all. And so I was sold to a different trafficker. That's really when I, I, I started seeing the extreme violence. I just find myself asking myself, like, how did my life end up like that? Like, how could that happen to me? I came to the house, I did a tour. When I pulled into the driveway, I just immediately started bawling. I remember coming to the front door and Kim opens the door and she's like, hi, how are you? And we get to the room and she's like, this would be your room. I can't tell you how many days I, I physically could not even sleep in my bed when I first got here. I lived a really long time going from like hotel to hotel. So having like my own bed really freaked me out. I couldn't lay down without having flashbacks. So I slept on the floor and the staff, they let me sleep on the floor. And I think that that is when I, I knew like I had to trust these people, like I had to trust them. Every day I'm, I'm swimming upstream and every day it's a battle, but every day it's worth it. It is so worth it. This is a home. This is where I learned what normal family dinners look like. This is where I learned what regular movie nights with friends look like. This is where I learned that you can cook dinner and not drink. This is where I learned how to establish healthy friendships with people. All it takes is that one person to believe that you can do it. And then you actually start to believe yourself that you can do it. And Kim has really been that person for me for the past three and a half years. It defined for me the type of woman that I wanted to be. It defined for me the type of relationship I wanted with God. I started seeing all these other people around me have their own personal relationships with God that I was like, hey, I want that too. I started seeing women around me that had college degrees, who had careers. And I started telling myself, hey, I want that too. If somebody told me in 2016 this was gonna be my life in 2020, I would have laughed. Because I really did not envision a life other than prostitution. So I'm just forever grateful to Naomi's house. Because if it weren't for them, I would still be living the same life. And when we talk about redemption and when we talk about the very literal breaking of the the shackles that I was in like Jesus knew I couldn't do it so he did it for me
You may know this already, but our, our Serve the World initiative exists to help support local and global ministries that are making the gospel tangible, making it seen. And I can't think of a more powerful example of that than what we just saw and heard together. You know, every Advent, we, we have the opportunity to help support one of our Serve the World partners. This year, during these weeks, if you would like to give towards this goal of raising $200,000 to help create a, a space, a day program for Naomi's house, that will allow them to do four times the ministry that they're currently able to do. Um, throughout these weeks, if, if you would like to give to this initiative, you can go to uh, chapelstreet.church slash STW giving to find out more information about Naomi's house and also to, uh, to enter into the giving portal there. And we encourage you to, to check that out. Let's pray together and we'll open up God's word. Father, we do just thank you. Lord, we thank you for the power of your redemptive work. We thank you for the stories that you continue to write just like the one that, that we heard, like the one that you are writing in our lives. Lord Jesus, today as we open up your word, may you continue to show us more of who you are and more of who we can be in you. And we ask these sayings in your name. Amen. Well, last week, if you were with us, we began our Advent series entitled Home for Christmas. And Jeff uh, began in... in Somewhat of an atypical way. It's, it's not necessarily atypical if you're used to kind of a liturgical reading through the Advent season. But, but for most of us, when we think about Christmas, we don't automatically think about Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. But Jeff went into the creation narrative and he described for us what we've sort of affectionately referring to in this series as, as home. Uh, what we were created for. And ultimately, then, he, he talked about what went wrong. He talked about the impact of sin and, and really our condition in sin as being spiritually homeless. How we will never fully grasp the beauty of Advent until we understand the ugliness of sin. Until we understand what we lost. Home. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian and pastor, said this about Advent. He said, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. With a clear understanding of, of what we talked about last week, about our condition of, of being troubled in soul, of being poor and imperfect, I want us to look at kind of the second half of, of this quote. I want to talk about our longing for home, looking forward to something greater to come. Several years ago, when, when our three daughters were younger, Sherry and I had the opportunity to, to plan a trip to Disney. So we wanted to surprise the girls. And we wrapped up a gift at Christmas time. And inside of it were some t-shirts with Disney characters and those little Mickey Mouse ears and trinkets. And, and there was a card that just said, this summer, we're all going to go to Disney. And of course, they opened it up and they were thrilled and excited. And, and then they entered this, this space, a space between having received the promise of Disney and yet waiting for the experience of it. There was six months of anticipation, six months of planning and talking and thinking about what rides they wanted to go on and, and what the activities would be and where we were going to eat and all the fun that they were going to have. They were living between the promise and the experience. And every day, every day they longed for it. They waited for it. We all did. We all looked forward to something that was to come. Last week, Pastor Jeff referenced Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is verse 11. It says this. It says when, he says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. 
And he's also said eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So the, the, in Ecclesiastes, we discover that this longing that we experience, this, this longing for home, this return, this desire for a return to this unashamed and uninhibited relationship with our Creator God that existed prior to the entrance of sin, this is, this is hardwired into us. We're, we are created for something more. And so even for you and I, on, on this side of the arrival of Jesus, we still long for the fullness of home. So today I want us to take a look at a, another group of Jesus followers who were longing for home. And I want to consider how the author of the letter to the Hebrews instructs the church to live in light of that longing. We're going to talk about this as, as principles for living away from home. Principles for living away from home. So let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. And before we look at these verses, I, I, I want to give us just a little bit of background here. Because the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Christians, like so many of our New Testament letters, who are facing intense persecution. So much so that, that some of them have or are considering abandoning their faith in Jesus. So for the first uh, 10 chapters of this letter, the author is, is making the case as to why Jesus is superior to any other means that they might think they have to relate to God. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, there's, there's a shift. There is a turn. He begins to show us example after example of people who lived by faith as they waited for the fulfillment of a promise. In that case, using the examples that he gives, the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. And he does so in order to help the church that he's writing to, a people who are trying to live by faith as they wait for the fulfillment of another promise. So after, exciting, uh, after citing uh, these examples of people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob, right in the middle of this chapter, there's this, this interlude, this interruption, where the author breaks in and provides some application. And this is where we're going to pick things up. This is in verse 13 of Hebrews 11. It says, all these people were still living, referring to the examples that he's given, by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let's look at these principles of living away from home, beginning with the principle of seeing and welcoming. The principle of seeing and welcoming. In verse 13, the author of Hebrews says this. It says, all the people that were still living by faith when they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, he says. Have you ever, have you ever seen the Grand Canyon? I have. I saw it from the window of an airplane some 30,000 feet in the air. So I can I could tell you that it's there. I could say that I've seen it, but have I experienced it? Have you ever seen New York City? I have from a window at LaGuardia Airport. I, I could see the, the skyline. I could testify to its existence, but I saw it from a distance, from afar. I, I've seen them, but I haven't experienced them. See, the first principle of living away from home is to acknowledge the promise of home. To acknowledge the promise of home, the pastor here is evoking in the minds of this 
group of people who are followers of Jesus and who are well-versed in the Old Testament. He's evoking this image of, of people like Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 3, who, who's provided this opportunity to go up onto the mountainside and to see off in the distance the promised land. And he's seeing it. He's, he's greeting it from a distance. He's desiring it for the people of Israel, but he knows that they won't experience it until after he's gone. Or of Abraham, who was promised that his descendants would become so great that they would become a nation, and from that nation, all nations on earth would be blessed. But he sees the promise from a distance with only the view of his one son, Isaac, as a glimpse of this fulfilled promise. So what is the promise, then, that the author of Hebrews wants us to acknowledge? What is the promise that he wants us to see and to welcome, even if it's from a distance? It's the promise of home. Flip back just, just a few verses earlier to the end of chapter 10. This is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35 through the end of the chapter. This pastor writing to the church says this. He says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. In verse 37, now he starts to quote two Old Testament prophets, the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Habakkuk. He says, for in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. But to those who have faith and are saved. What's the promise here? What's the promise that the author wants us to see, to welcome, to cling to. It's right there in verse 37. In just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. It's the promise of the return of Christ. It's the promise that the one who came to earth to become one of us, Emmanuel, will come again. And when he does, he's coming in order to restore this place. He's coming in order to restore his people and his kingdom that we experience in part in the here and now will be experienced in full. He who is coming will come and will not delay. And when he does, he's going to set everything right. He's going to make all things new. In fact, the, the Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, he describes this, and I, I want us to hear this, and I want us to think about why this, this feels so familiar. Listen to these verses. This is Revelation 21, verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are true and trustworthy. Why does that sound so familiar? It's because it's, it's describing what, what we saw in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's, it's describing a condition where we are with God and there's no barrier and there's no baggage and there's no brokenness. It's a restoration of, of what's been lost. You see, we, we are a people 
between the advents. We, we have the benefit and the confidence of living after the, the promise of God was fulfilled when he took on flesh and became one of us. But we are also a people in waiting. We too who long for home. We, we see the promise and, and, and we welcome the promise just as Moses and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac acknowledged and believed the promise of God. We see it, but we see it from a distance. We are a people who long for, waiting for something greater to come. And then this leads us in, into the second principle, the second principle of, of living away from home. And this is the principle of living as a stranger. Living as a foreigner or a stranger, you probably noticed back in Hebrews. Listen to the way this, in, at the end of verse 13, he talks, he says, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of a country that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they're longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I mentioned earlier that, that there was that time between when my daughters heard that we were going to be taking a, a trip to Disney and, and the experience of that. And so how do you think I utilized those six months in our family? Like I wielded that anticipation in that trip like a weapon, right? All the time I was saying things like, you know, uh, kids that, that want to go to Disney don't really fight with their siblings. Or kids that are going to go to Disney shouldn't leave dishes in the sink. I don't think kids going to Disney forget to make their beds. Like, I, it, was, it was a constant refrain in the house because I was, this is not a perfect example, but I was using this anticipated future in an effort to define current behavior. Here as we think about this, this principle of living as a foreigner or a stranger means that that our values and our purpose and our behavior, they aren't determined by our past. They're really not even determined by our present. They're determined by our future. And again here, the author is drawing on this, this Old Testament heritage that the people had. Moses leading the people out of Israel, who is finds themselves wandering in the desert for 40 years and he's constantly reminding the people not to get comfortable. He's constantly telling them that they might be living here now, but this is not our home. This Greek word in, in verse 14 that's translated as country it says they were they're looking for a country of their own. This word, it's, it's, it's rare in the New Testament. Because it means more than just like a defined geographical area or nation. It has the connotation of, of where you put down roots, right? Your homeland. This is spiritually speaking, the author wants us to understand that we are sojourners passing through. That my, my identity and my purpose, those are rooted in my home. And my home is rooted in a future promise. When I was in high school, I, I had the opportunity to travel to Albania. In the first summer, the summer between my junior year of high school and my, summer, uh, and my senior year of high school, I went on a two-week trip and I loved it. And so the following summer before I, I left for college, I went for the whole summer. And I was over there and, and doing ministry and a part of that. And so I spent that year trying to learn more about the culture, learn more about the people, learn a little bit more about the language. And, and yet when I went over there, and despite the fact that I was there for a much longer time, it, it was, I was no more an Albanian than I was the previous summer. 
I stood out just as much as I did. Everywhere I went, it was obvious that I was an American because I didn't fit in. Right? Here's the point. You and I, as, as Advent people longing for home, we are always going to be a little bit weird. Right? We're, we're, we're always going to, to feel a little bit out of place. In fact, I, I would suggest that if I never feel that way, if I never feel like I am swimming upstream of the culture, it's an indicator that I am perhaps starting to make this my home. That, that I'm starting to put down roots. But we're called to be foreigners, to be strangers. Again, not, I'm, I'm not talking about isolation. I'm not, I'm not talking about removing ourselves from this world and, and just waiting it out until one day we make it home. Right? Scripture is clear that, that while we are here, we have a job to do, and it revolves our engagement. But it is also clear that we are just passing through. So for you and I as, as Advent people... Our engagement in the present should not, uh, our engagement in the present should be defined by the promise of our future. Let me say that again. Our engagement in the present should be defined by the promise of our future. It's the, it's the principle of living as a foreigner or a stranger. And then this leads us to this, this third principle that we discover here, and that's the principle of living by faith the principle of living by faith. And this, this really is the central thrust of this entire chapter. Notice how at the very beginning in, in verse 13 again, it says all these people were still living by faith when they died. That phrase, by faith, is repeated. It's used 24 times throughout this single chapter because it is it is the essential point that the author makes about living as Advent people, about living as a people in waiting. At the outset of this chapter, the author defines faith for us. This is verse 1 in Hebrews 11. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. He goes on to say, This is what the ancients were commended for. Faith is a reasoned confidence that God is going to do what he said he will do. And as evidence of this, the author provides example after example of people living this way. Not, not only as an exhortation so that you and I will live this way, but as evidence for why we can. I, uh, I'm, I'm borrowing an illustration from Tim Mackey, but it, it resonated with me. He tells the story of living in in Wisconsin, he talks about Midwestern winters and how, uh, how long they go and how we always, by the time spring is starting to emerge, by the time we get to about March, there's just this tremendous longing that we have to get outdoors again. And here in the Midwest, we have a, a flower called the crocus flower. It's one of the earliest blooming flowers in the spring. In fact, it'll oftentimes bloom so early that there will be a snowfall that still happens following these flowers blooming. And it's, it's beautiful because there's this bright contrast of color set against the backdrop of the pure white snow. And then you and I, when, when it hits 45 degrees, what does all Midwesterns do? If we have a bright, sunny day that's mildly starting to get warm in the spring, right? we, we put on shorts, we, we put on t-shirts, the, the entire world seems to go outside. Everybody starts jogging and walking the dog. We act like it's the middle of the summer. Right? It's, it's, it is faith, it's an action that is built on the promise that summer is coming. And what evidence do we have of this? Why can we do this? We can point to the crocus flower. We can point to a flower that's blooming even in the midst of the snow because it's a reminder, it's evidence that summer is on its way. 
we have something to point to for our confidence. This is what the author of Hebrews is getting at. This is the principle of living by faith as Advent people. Mackey goes on to say, he says, Faith is an experience you have when you obey and follow Jesus in a way that makes no sense in light of your present surroundings and only makes sense in light of the future. Faith is an experience you have when you obey and follow Jesus in a way that makes no sense. No sense in light of your present, your present surroundings and only makes sense in light of your future. In light, as Bonhoeffer put it, of something greater. If we think about the examples that were provided in Hebrews 11, we see, we see men and women whose actions only makes sense in light of a promised future. And here's the question then that that we have to ask ourselves, that we have to wrestle with. And that is, how does our longing for a future home define or empower our present obedience? How does our longing for home define the way that we're living in the here and the now? Because it only makes sense if we have a faith in a God who made the promise, right? Sacrificial generosity, the, the, the sort of generosity that cost us, that only makes sense if we believe that this is not our home. Genuine, meaningful integrity only makes sense if we have a faith that something greater is still to come. Unconditional love for our, our family, for our friends, for our neighbors, for people we don't like very much, for for our enemies. Unconditional love for our world only makes sense if there will be a day when the one who came to be with us, Emmanuel, comes again to make all things new. In the meantime, we live by faith as Advent people who see and welcome the promise, even if it's from a distance, who live as strangers and foreigners, and who do so in faith that one day he will come and we will dwell with him. We will be home again. You know, in in our attempts to live by faith, God has given us, I think, the most powerful crocus flower, the most powerful evidence of his promise. But what he accomplished on the cross and in the empty tomb. So today at at home, I encourage you to gather together the elements for communion. And I'll give you just a moment to do that. And and then I want to lead us and coming. And as we do so, I I want us to come back to what Christ accomplished on the cross as a reminder of the promise and as a reminder of the evidence that we have to why we can trust him, why we can put our faith in him. When Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, He took bread and he broke it. He said, this bread is my body that I will give for you. And then he handed it to his disciples and he said, take and eat in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood. This cup is the blood of a new covenant that's been shed for the forgiveness of sins. And he took the cup and he gave it to them. This is the blood of Jesus that's been shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him.
Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ability to come to the table to be reminded of what you have accomplished. And yet we are a people in waiting. We are a people longing for home. You wired it into us. So God, I pray that the promise of that future defines our presence. And Lord, when we're weak or when we're wavering, would you bring us back? Would you bring us back to your table? Would you remind us again of why our faith is confident? Why we can put our trust in you? And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Now let me offer this morning's benediction. We send you in the name of Jesus Christ, who has called us out as foreigners and strangers to live here now, but while longing from home. Go with him. Amen.